Hey everybody, this is Pastor Kevin. You are in for a big treat today. The California kid all the way from Irvine, California is home today. Garrison Charles Barton Cooley is going to be preaching the gospel to you today. He's been out in California at Bible College studying and preparing. So he's just full of the word and the spirit. And he shared with me some of the things that he's going to share with you today. And it is awesome. The word, it's about the word of God. And it will be a tremendous, tremendous blessing and encouragement to your life. I just can't wait for you to hear this amazing message. Garrison, welcome home. I'm so proud of you. And Harvest Church, would you please stand up and welcome home the California kid, Garrison Cooley. Come on, everybody. Hello, 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 Harvest Church. How are we doing this morning? Amazing. Well, I'm so thankful to be here. I'm so excited. Uh, you may be seated. And uh, it's always fun to be home and to be here with you guys. And I just love this church so much. I know my parents love this church. And they are out in Oregon preaching at uh, a friend's church out there. And I know they're doing amazing stuff right now out there. So, but before I go, any further, it's just what I like to do. I think it, there's a principle in this of you can never over honor. And so I, was, I would just really like to take this moment, dad, if you're watching, or mom, if you're watching, uh, you're probably preaching right now, so you're probably not watching, but I just wanna take this moment and say, you guys have the most amazing pastors on the planet. Can we just clap right now for Pastor Kevin and Pastor Adrian? Uh, I know that dad, if you walk up to him and you ask him a question or you ask him for an idea, you better go ahead and just grab a pen, grab a notepad, because he's gonna hit you with at least a hundred different ideas. That man is a visionary. That man has a word from God and he's ready to just go and gain land for the kingdom and win souls. He loves Jesus with all his heart. He loves this church. And my mom as well, she is such a visionary, such a leader. I believe they're both pioneers and I love them so much. And thank you for letting me do this, dad. Mom, it's a blessing and it's fun. And I love talking about Jesus. So that's what we're gonna do for the next few moments is, uh, I would like to kind of center this uh, time that we have together around this thought. And it's this thought of, it's not what I thought it would look like. So let's turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter two, verse 13. And it says this, for this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. So what is a word from God? And in scripture, we see it mentioned in a few different ways. And two of those ways is uh, the word logos and the word rhema. And oftentimes when we see those words, it's saying that God wants to reveal something to us about himself. Most of the time when God speaks, well, all of the time when God speaks, it's not because he doesn't know something about us. Every time it's because he wants to show us something or reveal something about himself. And so before, um, before in the beginning, right? When God spoke the word, it first began with a thought. And so when God is speaking, it's, it's speaking of all of his supremacy over all of creation. And so when we see the word, we also see that in John chapter one, verse 14, that the word was made flesh. So I don't know about you today, but who in here has received the word. You can raise your hand. And if you haven't, don't be ashamed. You don't have to raise your hand. It's not like you're super Christian and you have a great sticker that just says how amazing of a Christ follower you are. If you haven't received the word, that's okay. 
But I just wanna encourage you and remind you that if you have accepted Jesus, if you would say, and you're in this room today, and you would say that Jesus is my Lord, I'm following him, I love Jesus, I've devoted my life to him, then I want to let you in on a little secret that you have the greatest word that anyone can ever have. And that word is Jesus. Because in first, uh, J- John chapter one, it says that the word was made flesh and he dwelt among us. And the word that was spoken from the father's mouth that sparked all of creation. If you are a Christ follower and you are here today, that word that sparked all of creation into being is within you. I know that is encouraging. (laughs) And I just wanna remind us all here today that we all have a word. It says in the Bible that no one is with excuse of the acknowledgement that God exists in creation. We can look out at the stars and the heavens and the mountains and the valleys and we know that God exists. We can look out into creation and know the goodness of God because his creation declares his faithfulness. His creation declares his goodness. So we all have received the word. But it says in this verse that Paul, he, he mentioned something that to me was interesting when I read it because he said, not as the word of men. He said, you heard us, you've heard our word and you have accepted it, not as the word of men. So Paul has been in places and in spaces and in cities and regions where he preached the word of God. He preached Jesus, he preached the good news, but people heard it not as a word from God, but as a word of man. So I wanna help us here today to distinguish the two between a word from God and a word from man. In James chapter three, verse eight, it says, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. A word from man, it fades, it divides, it's unclear, it hides from truth. It's a deadly poison. It says in Psalms chapter 18, verse 30, As for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in him. A word from God brings unity. It stands the test of time. It brings restoration and wholeness, produces new identity, the ultimate authority. It's perfect, it guards. We have the word of God right here in our very hands, we have it on our phones, we have it, we have so much accessibility to the word of God and the word of God. If you're lacking unity, here's unity. If you're lacking wholeness, here is wholeness. If you need a new identity and you look at your life and you're not satisfied with it, here is a new identity. If you need protection, if you need a guard, If you're lacking truth in your life, we have the perfect word of God. And I hope that I never mistake the two between a word from God and a word from man. But how do you how do you differ the two? How how do you know? How do you really know? Because sometimes it's tricky. I would be lying to you today if I told you that every time God spoke, I knew it was him. Or every time that a person said something and, and uh, uh, Pastor Jake, he is uh, the youth pastor that I'm under out at Bible college. He calls them prophet liars. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> In Romans 12, verse two, it says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and improve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So how do you know? It's through the renewing of your mind, through the word. And if we're Jesus people, that means the word is within us. 
And we have the power of the Holy Spirit to reveal truth to us through scripture. And so we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. And then you can know what the will of God is. And the will of God is in the word. If you're ever doubting what the will of God is and you don't know what God's word is, then look to the word because the will is in the word. I love what F.F. Bosworth said. He's a old time revivalist. So you know, he's like OG, he's like a beast. It says faith is, is known or faith is found where the will of God is known. So faith is found where the will of God is known. And the will is good and the will is pleasing and it's perfect. So do you want God's word to work in you? At the end of verse 13, where we have this passage, so we've talked about the word of man, that they didn't receive it as a word for man, but of God, for what it really was. And it's the word which also performs its perfect work in you who believe. And I got to this verse and it sounded great. I was really stoked on it. I was ready. But then when I read it, this is where I found the tension in my own life of God. He wants to work, do a work in us. But how often when I'm in a space like this, when I'm in a service, when God's moving and it's the band is playing amazing worship and we get the feeling and we get the butterflies and it's amazing and God's working and he's working around us. And then we leave this place. I'm keeping it real. We leave this place and we go back to our normal life. We go back to our work and then we don't feel it anymore. I don't know about you, but I know for me, sometimes I just don't feel it. Sometimes I'm looking around my life and I'm like, God, I know you said in this verse, you wanna do something in me, but I'd much rather you do something around me if I'm being honest. But see, that's the problem is because we, we're so caught up of what's around us and we're like, God, I want you to move. I wanna see you move, do something around me. And he doesn't do it. And he wants to do something in you. First, before he does something around you, he wants to do something in you. And when he doesn't do that, how often in my own life have I looked back on belief? And I've said, belief, this is, on, this is your fault because you're, God wants to do something in me. And because I'm so caught up of what's around me, I'm not seeing my, my re reality isn't changing. And because my reality isn't changing and my life is still broken and I'm still hurting and I'm still in the addiction and I'm still in the pain and I can't get over, I can't forgive that person. My reality isn't changing, but God, maybe God doesn't wanna change your reality. Maybe he doesn't wanna change what's around you, but he wants to change who you are on the inside because he wants to change you from the inside out. And maybe he doesn't wanna stop the storm. Maybe he wants to equip you to get through the storm because when you get through the storm, you declare the goodness of God. But how often times do I give up on belief? Because I get tired of what the promise really looks like. But I found a story in the Bible that made me feel not so alone. And hopefully it does the same for you. And it's in Numbers chapter 13. And just for a little bit of context, it's the people of Israel and God, he delivers the people out of uh, Egypt and he splits the Red Sea. He does all these amazing miracles. He, he leads the, the people through the wilderness in supernatural ways. He gives them food, water flows out of a rock. I mean, wild supernatural things where if you saw it, you would know 100% that God is real. And so the people of Israel, they've seen the faithfulness of God. God has spoken audibly to their leader, Moses. And Moses is, he's leading 
through the wilderness and they get to the land of Canaan. And this land is the land that God spoke of. This is the word. This is the promise. They've, they've gone through horrendous environments to get to this place. And so th- this is what the verse says. Well, Moses, he sends them, he sends 12 spies into the land of Canaan to go check it out, to go make sure that, that this is the place. And so this is what it says. It says, this is what they reported to Moses when they came back. We went, they said this, we went to the land where you sent us. It really is a land flowing with milk and honey. Here's some of the fruit, but the people who live there are strong and the cities have walls and are very large. We even saw the descendants of Enoch there. So the people, they knew the promise or the word of God was legit. That was not the issue. They saw the promise with their very eyes. They said, truly, it is flowing with milk and honey. They brought back fruit from the land in their very hand. So it wasn't that they thought God's word wasn't true. They knew it to be true. They, they had evidence. They had physical evidence. They saw it with their eyes. They had the fruit in their hand. But the problem was that through this journey of going through the wilderness and getting to this place of the promise and of the word that God gave them, the struggle within this isn't that God wasn't true. It wasn't that the word of God just was flawed. They got, they didn't get to the right. It wasn't that God led them to the wrong place. How often in life do we know God's word to be true? And the struggle isn't within the clarity of scripture. And the struggle isn't within the opportunity being there. And the struggle isn't within the relationships that God has built within community. And the struggle isn't within coming to church on Sunday. And I can go on and on. And the struggle isn't within the time of worship with our hands lifted. And the struggle isn't within even reading the Bible and believing with, our, with faith and claiming things that God has promised us. That's sometimes not the struggle. I've grown up in church. I'm a pastor's kid. I've looked at this thing and there's been times where I myself had to decide, am I gonna follow this thing or not? And the struggle wasn't knowing if it was true or not. The struggle is within, am I gonna do what I wanna do? (laughs) And sometimes we look at the promise and we have the fruit in our hand. And we, we get upset because when God gave the people of Israel this word, this promise of the promised land, a place to call home, God never mentioned the opposition once. And see, this is where I can self-evaluate myself. And I can say that anytime I've stepped out in faith on a word from God, never once has God been like, Garrison, I wanna send you to California, but rent's gonna be expensive. Here's some opposition for you. He doesn't lay out a list of all the opposition all the struggle, all the things that we have to go through when we step out in faith, he just says, here's the promise. Yeah. 
but we, we step out in faith and we, this is a pattern within scripture. Peter is a great example. Peter, he's in the boat and he sees Jesus walking on water and he doesn't mention this to any of his friends in the boat. He just goes. If that was me, I would run that by somebody first. <laughs> hey bro, you think I should do this? He just goes. It's such a Peter thing to do. But he steps out and when he steps out in faith, it says that the wind came. And it was in the moment of stepping out from a word. Oh, I love this picture. Because he's stepping out from a word to the word. Mm. And Jesus, he's on the water. He's like, come to me, Peter. I'm the guy who created this whole thing. You're chilling. You can walk on water. I'm with you. I mean, I, I made this. I was the thing that the father spoke and I went out and created. Step out. And so there's a moment of a beautiful relationship between the two. And it's within this moment that Peter's walking on water and his eyes are fixed perfectly on Jesus. And it wasn't a magical spell and it wasn't the right prayer and it wasn't reading enough books and it wasn't knowing the right people. It wasn't an amazing opportunity. Heck, he was in a boat in the middle of a storm. That doesn't sound like a good opportunity to me. It wasn't the right door. but it was Jesus and that's all that Peter needed. And he stepped out and we see this beautiful moment, Peter and Jesus looking eye to eye, he's walking on the water. But then the wind comes, the opposition happens and his eyes, they look away and he focuses his, his thoughts and his, and his mind on the wind and then he sinks. Jesus didn't say, come out on the water. By the way, there's a storm. There's going to be wind. Make sure you keep your eyes on me. Here's the rule book. Here's the directions. Let's do this thing. Let's blow all your buddies' minds. He didn't say that to Peter. He just said, step out. I'm out here. Come on. I think it's this beautiful moment. Or how many opportunities do we get in life to step out, to have faith, to do the miraculous? But he doesn't mention the opposition because I want to propose this question to you. He doesn't mention the opposition because what is opposition to God? I mean, this is the God that that defeated Goliath. This is the God that broke down the walls of Jericho. This is the God that delivered three young boys from a fiery furnace. This is the God who sent an army of angels that surrounded Elijah. This is that God. This is the God that came down in flesh like you and I and was tempted in every way, every shape, every form, every opportunity to fail. Trust me, Jesus was hit way harder than you and I because he was the greatest threat that the enemy could have ever had. And this is the God that walked the earth, healed the sick, answered almost every question with the question. That's miraculous. This is the God that hung on a cross for you and I, that took all of our shame, all of our burden, all of our sin, and God himself turned his back to him. This is that God, and that God died and went to hell for you and I, 
and kicked butt in hell. This isn't the God that died, went down to hell and then sung a good Sunday school song and clapped and danced and said, guys, I'm sorry you're feeling this way, but I'm here. No, it says that he stripped all principalities, all authority. He took the keys from the devil and he gave them to you and I so that now we can have and walk in all authority on the earth. This is the God I'm talking about. So what is opposition to God? What is it? What is opposition to God? So maybe the family unit's falling apart, but can I encourage you today? What is opposition to God? Maybe your finances are falling apart, but can I encourage you today? What is opposition to God? Maybe you're not working at the dream job you've always imagined, and maybe you feel like you're not in the will of God. Maybe you're struggling. Maybe you're battling with depression and shame and anxiety, but can I encourage you today? What is opposition to God? Because this is the God that we serve. He breaks chains. He delivers. He sets free. He, he calls out and creates and begins and refreshes and starts anew and births something new within you and I. Because when we are set free in Jesus, it's not something that we just pick up in our life. We actually completely start over. We're a new creation in him. This isn't something that we go and we live a daily life and now I've just added something to my portfolio. No, this is not what this is. You you lose it all. You give it all to Jesus and you begin something brand new. So can I ask you this question today? What is opposition to God? Let's start praying for bigger things. Let's start having faith for bigger things because can I tell you today, you're not too old, you're not too young, you're not too screwed up. You haven't sinned enough for God to give up on you because what is opposition to God? God is that good. He's that good. And how often? Because God isn't doing something around us that he wants to first do something in us that we give up on belief and we forget the fact that God is that good and that God, what is opposition to God? So there's this man. There's this man. He was teaching in a Bible school and he wanted to get around lost people because he just had that urge. And he just was kind of exhaustive teaching in the school all day. And he was hours and hours of just lessons and lectures and trying to just build up disciples and, and pastors and it's just like what he does. And, but he just is an evangelist. He just loves winning lost people to Jesus. So he just got on his little motorcycle and he went to a train station. And as he's driving to this train station, he gets there and out of the corner of his eye, he sees an old man on the ground. And let, let me just paint this picture for you of how this old man looked as he was small and, and skinny and his skin was stretched tight over his bones. And he had cataracts over his eyes, he couldn't see. And so this young man, he gets off his motorcycle and he walks over to him and he says, uncle, uncle. And he's, where are you? You couldn't see him. So he got a little closer. He says, God sent me to tell you about a man named Jesus. And the old man, he looks up and he says, what's his name? He says, uncle, uncle, his name is Jesus. And then quickly, a response, he goes, water, water. He was thirsty. And when he said that, the Holy Spirit spoke to this young man. He said, this man is about to enter in, slip into eternity forever without me. And so this young man, he goes and he grabs water and he buys him a little banana so he can just have some food. Gives him water and gives him the banana and again, he says, uncle, have you, 
heard of this man, his name's Jesus, and he came and he died for you and he, he wants to give you redemption. And that word in Hindi, it's, it's an important word. It, it carries weight and it's, it's a big thing for the Hindus. Say, God wants to give you redemption, uncle. And so again, he just says, what's his name? And so the young man gets a little discouraged. Like, ah, oh, he must not be understanding me. The, the language barrier is just too broken. And so the old man, he asks, can you pick me up and take me over to the gate of the train station? Because that's where everyone walks. And I'll be able to beg for enough money to eat one last meal before I die. And this man, he's covered with just a loincloth as clothes. And again, he's cataracts over his eyes, skin stretched tightly across his bones. He's laying in his own waist. There's flies all around him. He smells awful, gross and dirty. But this young man, he scoops him off the ground out of his own waist and he carries him over to the gate. And as he's carrying him one more time, he says, uncle, there's a man named Jesus and he died for your sins. And all you have to do is believe and confess that he's your Lord. And you'll be able to spend eternity with him. And he'll set you free and you'll have wholeness and you'll have a relationship with your father forever. And again, he says, I, what's his name? So they get, you know, about probably a hundred yards over the gate and he sets him down. And as this young man, he's given up. He doesn't understand me. He goes to walk away. And as he's walking away, one last time, he yells out, what's his name? He just uh, turns around, he says, his name's Jesus. And he responds, he says, that's a good God. Yes, he is. And he's walking away and from behind him with his back turned, he just hears this old man, he yells out, his name is Jesus and he is my Lord. That young man was my father and I believe that one day they'll be in heaven together dancing because God's that faithful. He's that faithful. He's so faithful that he sent a man across the globe from Jackson, Mississippi with the word. And that word is Jesus. And maybe what was around him wasn't what he wanted. And maybe what was around him was a broken reality of pain and suffering. But just because the people of Israel didn't enter in to the promised land because of their doubt and unbelief, God was still faithful. It was God's will for them to enter in. It was God's will for them to inherit the promise. But because they didn't, they didn't enter in, but just because they didn't enter in didn't mean God wasn't faithful. He already given them the promise. He already said, this land is yours. And God is so faithful that there was two spies who believed. And God allowed an entire generation to die in the wilderness because he was faithful to the two. The two entered in, they inherited the promise. So can I just encourage you today that I don't know what your outer reality looks like. I don't know. And maybe what God is doing around you doesn't match what God is doing in you. 
but God is faithful. He's good. He does a perfect, a perfect work in those who believe. So we're about to go into worship and we're gonna respond to the faithfulness of God today. Because this could be great. This could be good. This could be inspiring. This could make you feel good. But that means nothing if there's no response. Can we just take a moment right now to respond? Let's stand to our feet and respond to the faithfulness of God. I think that it would be ridiculous to sing about Jesus, to talk about Jesus, but not give anyone in this room the opportunity to accept Jesus. And so if that's you and you're in this room today with every head bowed and eye closed, if you need to accept Jesus to be the Lord of your life, it's not hard, it's not, it's not difficult. It's actually as simple as A, B, C. And A, you admit, you admit that you're a sinner and in need of a savior. B, you believe in your heart. And C, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. So if that's you in this room and you need to accept Jesus and you need a word from God, you need the word. Without the word, there is nothing. Without the word, there is darkness. Without the word, there is brokenness. Without the word, without Jesus, he is the only way to the Father. So if that's you and you're in this room today and you need to accept Jesus and make him the Lord of your life, right now, raise your hand. Okay. All right, church, let's pray this prayer after me. Say, Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. And I believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord. And I confess with my mouth that he's my savior. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. If you raised your hand or if you prayed that prayer in your heart for the first time, welcome to the family of God and welcome to your family here at Harvest Church.